I'm Greg, uh, the Director of Technology at ICIG Plant, and uh, I'm here to talk about seven habits of a high-performing team. So, I thought before we kick off, I should talk a little bit, a little bit about what I mean by a high-performing team. I think a high-performing team is one that spends most of its time solving interesting problems for the businesses that they work in, putting value into the hands of customers uh, early and often, and spending as little time as possible on toil. So things like bug fixes, outages, complex manual deployments, meeting hell, all the stuff that makes the job really unfun to do. And most engineers I've spoken to uh, who got into this craft didn't get into it to do all of those things. Uh, no one chose to spend the weekend deploying something, having everything break, and then spending the next week on break fixes. I've come to believe that habits make high-performing teams. It's um, fairly intuitive, I think, for most people to think that the way you create a high-performing team is you go and spend a huge amount of money on the top 1% of the market, put them all in a room together, load them up with coffee, and <laughs> <laughs> expect great things to happen. Um, but I don't think that high-performing teams are made up of great individuals. I think great individuals are built by high-performing teams, and that high-performing teams are built on a system of habits. So habits are the automatic things that just happen. Our teams are made up of people, um, people make mistakes, and teams with strong habits create a baseline for us to fall back to. <clears throat> They're the things that we do every day that move us in the direction that we want to go. So let's kick on with habits. So the first habit is work in small steps. And this is a bit of a foundational habit and I might refer back to it a few times. Um, this is about setting ourselves up to deliver some portion of value <laughs> early and get feedback often. This is not about deciding the solution to a problem, dividing it up into tiny little pieces, spreading it out across the entire team, and hoping that we can put it all back together at the end. This is quite different. This is working in a linear fashion towards some target condition, one step at a time. So at the end of every step, we sit up and we look around and we assess the situation. Are we on the right path? Uh, has anything changed? Has the target we're actually chasing changed? Have we learned anything new that could shortcut um, our, our path to our target? And I've spent a heap of years advocating for working in small steps, but honestly, I've struggled to articulate the benefits. And in the last couple of years, I stumbled across the work of a guy named Jipar Hill, uh, who has this great blog series called Many More Much Smaller Steps, where he lays it all out. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail on it because it will honestly take way too long. But I'm going to share some of the insights from those blogs. So the first part is, what is a step? <clears throat> so every piece of software we work on is currently in some state. Uh, some ready state is deployed and it's running in production. Customers are using it. We want to get to a target state. And once we get to that target state, it will again be ready for users to use. The step is the period of unreadiness between those two points. And importantly, we want to fix the maximum duration of that time. So we want to minimize the amount of time that the system we're working on is not ready. Some people call that time boxing. Um, so when I talk about small or short, uh, in that case, how short or small am I talking? <sighs> So I used to work with a guy who was really fond of this, this line, trot it out all the time. It's a little obvious, but when you think about it, the smallest unit of change that we can make to software is adding a line or deleting a line or editing a line. In a practical sense and from some experience, I think you're probably better off keeping the step length around the size of a few related test cases. And for us at ISIC Plant, that's somewhere between one and a half and two hours. So that means that we're starting and finishing some unit of real value every two hours. And in a team of six engineers who are working in pairs for an eight hour day, that's 12 steps that we can possibly get out the door every single day. It changes the way that you think about arranging code. 
the critical part of doing this is you have to resist the urge to get too far ahead. But doing this has a ton of advantages. So the first advantage is interruptibility. I reckon it'd be safe to assume that most people have experienced uh, the, the situation where they think if they got one more shoulder tap, they would have to throw everything they're working on out and start again. And that's usually because we're trying to juggle too many things at once. The trick is that you can be interrupted at any point that you're at a ready state. So the more often you can get back to ready, the more often you can be interrupted. And that's like a superpower. Sales ring you up and say, there's a million dollar opportunity, drop everything and fix it. You're at worst two hours away from being able to start actioning that. And the cost of being interrupted when you're not ready is also significantly lower. So what you're gonna throw two hours worth of work away, it's not as bad as throwing an entire day away. Somewhat related to interruptibility is steerability. It's really hard to change directions when you're moving on, on, on a path and you're in the middle of something. So steerability, uh, it's similar to when you're being interrupted. Every time you get to one of those ready states, you can pivot, you can change directions. You can see that the, the, the landscape of the solution you're building has changed and you can move in a different direction. And lots of steps give you lots more opportunities to pivot. Reversibility, if you don't like the thing that you just wrote, throw it out, it's two, it's two hours worth of code. Um, the sunk cost of throwing two hours worth of work away, um, it's, it's pretty low compared to throwing days or even weeks of work away. One thing I've found is that working in small steps and knowing that you can throw the code away really increases uh, the likelihood that you're gonna experiment. So you can start thinking about the changes you're making in a more experimental fashion. Rhythm, this is that strong regular repetition between periods of tension, so doing the work, and release, the really great feeling you get when you, you finish the thing that you're building. Um, and when you finish something, you get a really nice feeling. Your brain rewards you with all the feel-good chemicals and you feel great about having done something. Now. In my personal experience, I find it doesn't actually matter how big the piece of work was. The amount of good feelings I get is always the same. So I work on something for a month. I might get like an hour of feeling accomplishment before I have to go and deal with the first break fix. If I work for two hours, I also get an hour worth of feeling accomplished for doing it. And that repetition of those good feelings helps increase motivation. It gamifies uh, the, the building of software. You got one hour to go at the end of the day. Can you get a two hour change in in that period of time? It's worth trying. Scope, it's way easier to understand a small step than a big step. I think it's actually a really useful guide um, as to whether or not you're doing too much. Uh, if you can ex ex understand and explain the entirety of the change that you're about to make. If you can't, yeah, maybe it's too big. And safety. Small changes are inherently less risky. Uh, there's, there's less time between making a change and seeing the impact of that change, so you can roll things back if you, if you need to. Uh, they're also way easier to review, so there's a, there's a higher chance that your colleague's going to pick you off if you make a silly mistake. Habit two, zero known bugs in production. And this builds on the previous habit because every opportunity, oh sorry, every point that you can be interrupted is an opportunity to go and fix a bug if it's been reported. We treat this as kind of elevating a bug to the level of an outage. We treat bugs that are reported as if the system is down because it's broken. And for us, the process looks a little something like this. So a bug gets reported, that might be reported by some automated bug reporting system or by a user more likely filling something into a box. First thing we ask is, is it actually a bug? If you give a box to a user, they will use it to craft feature requests in the form of bug reports or <laughs> ask for support in the form of a bug report. Um, if it is not a bug, we reclassify it, we move it into some other process, hand it off to product uh, to, to investigate whether it's worth making the change, and then we're done. If it is a bug, we then ask ourselves, are we actually going to fix it? And this will differ from team to team. Some teams will not fix typos because it's just not worth doing it, or 
that one obscure rendering issue that only <laughs> impacts a 12 year old Android phone or something, maybe we don't, uh, we don't deal with that. So if we're not going to fix it, we close the bug and we're done. It's okay to close bugs that you're not going to fix. They will come back. That's the reason why your bug backlog has duplicates in it. Multiple people have reported the same thing over and over again, and they'll continue to do that. If it is a bug, fix it. That becomes your next highest priority piece of work. And then you close the ticket, and you're done. Yeah. Habit three, deploy every single change. This is how you derive the value from working in small steps and how you derive the value from uh, um, fixing bugs quickly. If you deploy every change and you're deploying a, a bug fix, that increases the amount of trust that your users and your stakeholders have in your system. I have bugs logged with vendors that have been logged for years and I have never heard anything back from them. I don't know if they're ever going to be fixed. Um, by deploying every change, if you fix a bug, the user will think, that's great. Hey, I've got my bug fixed. It's, it's, it's probably fixed within three hours. What we're aiming for here is for one change to equal one deploy. And at a minimum, your deployment should be a single click affair. I think that ideally, deployment should happen automatically on merge to main after a suite of tests are run to make sure that it's safe to do that. But deployment's painful. Um, the avoidance of deployment is what quarterly and half yearly um, deployment cycles look like, looks like. This creates a negative feedback loop. You have a really large quarterly deploy. It's really complicated. Uh, therefore, it's more risky. Therefore, you want to do it less frequently and round and around you go. This quote from Jess Humble is one of my favorites and it's kind of the recipe for breaking out of painful loops. If it hurts, do it more often. Deploying every change increases the rate of feedback that you get. It forces you to, to practice improving and reducing the pain over time. It exposes opportunities to automate things and improve consistency and take the human out of, of the deployment process, which I think would reduce a lot of anxiety about deployment that people have. And eventually it's no longer painful, it just happens. Deployments become routine. They stop being a source of anxiety, um, and that's a great thing. The other advantage of doing this is that you get rollbacks for free. So if every single change uh, creates a deployment and you find that your deployment has broken something, you have sort of a git revert, git push away from having that problem go away. It also means that late night deployments and week long firefighting should hopefully be a thing of the past. Another challenge that comes up when we talk about deploying every single change is the notion that people think that deployments equal release. And that was true um, in our industry when we were deploying software on CDs. Uh, but we're at a Laravel conference, so we're going to assume that we're not mailing CDs out to everybody. It's possible, and I'd say if you're going to practice continuous deployment essential, to be able to separate the active deployment from the active release. The way you do this is using mechanisms like feature flags um, so that you can hide things that aren't quite ready for prime time until you are ready to show it. And there's plenty of tools out there that facilitate that. Um, Laravel Pennant is a first party package that does this. If you like a more managed solution, there's paid tools like LaunchDarkly and PostHog. I will say as an aside that I, I personally think it's important that every deployment be seen by at least some real users because that's how you get the feedback. <laughs> It's, you know, it's, it's, it's not any different to having a long-lived branch that you're not merging to having a feature flag that no one can see. A lot of people also say you should feature flag everything, and I don't necessarily agree with that either. I think sometimes it's totally fine if you are making some change to an existing experience and you're just, you know, polishing something up or, or making, you're not making a, a huge change to just deploy it. It's fine. Most people will appreciate that. So most of these tools have some ability to specifically target groups of people. Um, so you can have a, a, a internal stakeholder group that gets the software first and then like a, a beta group that might get it next. Um, but yeah, using feature flags so that you can hide 
uh, features from, and, well, until the marketing department, I guess, is ready to release the feature. You do also get a bunch of other benefits from uh, separating deployment from release. You get kill switches. So if you're making a change to something that you know, might uh, impact your infrastructure, um, it's often easier to go into a database and turn a feature off so it stops smashing your infra than to do an actual deployment. Uh, canary rollouts are another really cool thing. You start ramping traffic into uh, a new feature uh, and monitor your infrastructure as you do that to make sure that you're not you know, overloading a database or something. So separating deployment from release makes deployments entirely an engineering problem. Release is still a business concern, but it means that we can deploy stuff whenever we feel like it. But doing that obviously requires that we're sure that we're not gonna break things when we do deploy, which brings us to the next habit. So it's really important that we make sure if a robot is deploying our code that we're you know, reasonably certain that we're not gonna take the whole business down when we do it. And there's a whole bunch of really great benefits for um, building automated testing. Sorry, this is the eat your vegetables part of the, of the talk. <laughs> I think we actually want QA to be an engineering function. We want to pull QA back into our work, uh, workflow. Because by the time you send something to QA, it's too late. The, the quality of the system is what it's going to be at that point. You can't inspect quality into, into a system. And external QA feedback loops are crippling. I think that if we built it, we should warrant it. Uh, it's not up to anyone else to, to be responsible for the quality of our code. Um, but importantly, it doesn't actually just stop at unit tests and, and feature tests. Testing is something that happens continuously through the entire lifecycle. So this is our software development lifecycle. If you've hung around with DevOps people, you've probably seen a graphic that looks like this before. Um, it's important to, to mention that we're on all of these steps all the time. So we might be building some new piece of code uh, while we're deploying something else and monitoring another thing. And at every one of these points, we're doing some form of testing. So on the left is all the sort of traditional programmer testing, uh, unit tests, feature tests, contract tests, usability testing, all the stuff that we, uh, you know, that sort of built into Laravel. But on the right, we're also doing testing in production. So these are things like synthetics, which are uh, basically bots that are constantly hitting specific parts of your application to make sure that they're rendering properly, rendering at the right speed, critical business functions are running and are set up to alert you if any of that behavior changes. A-B testing, so trying out two versions of a feature and seeing which one works, uh, which one works best. Observability, getting alerts and keeping an eye on how the infrastructure is going, particularly post deployment. Uh, chaos engineering, which is where you deliberately unplug something from the wall and see whether or not something breaks. That's really fun. So yeah, and, and all of the testing that we do on the right feeds back into the things that we're building on the left. So we learn things by running these tests in production that help inform how we'll build things going forward. Habit five, do the simplest thing that could possibly work. I think there's two sides to this. The first one is building simple solutions. And the second one is building them in the simplest way possible. So uh, there's been a ton of research done into uh, like the success of software features in really large organizations. And it seems to be that a good portion of validated fantastic ideas produce zero or negative value. So given that, we should be optimize, optimizing for being wrong, not for being right, because we are going to be wrong more often than we're right. It's fine to have a north star to walk toward, towards some design that you're ultimately going to implement if you do turn out to be right. But we keep looking for ways that we can do things simpler to validate those ideas continuously so that we can abandon them if it turns out that they're not actually gonna bring any value. So that, that's to avoid throwing out months worth of work when you find out that your customers weren't actually interested in the thing that you're building in the first place. So by way of an example, IC Plan is a, a B2B marketplace uh, in the construction sector. 
Um, and historically, all of our sales were done manually. So we would have outbound um, sales or a customer would ring up and say, hey, I want to buy a membership. And during COVID, when we were doing a lot of work to, to digitize the business and, and, and bring everything online, um, we wanted to know whether or not there was any appetite uh, to, buy, to buy our product online. So the first thing that you might go to is we need to build a shopping cart. So what does that look like for our marketplace? Well, first we're gonna need a pricing details page, obviously. And then because our products look a little bit complicated, we're gonna need some form of pricing calculator so people can get an accurate quote. And then we're gonna need a credit card form and automation to set up the billing in our subscription system. Automated notifications into Slack so that someone from sales can go and ring the bell. <laughs> notifications downstream uh, to all of our other systems to notify them that a customer's moved from free to paid. Enrollment and marketing automation. Task setting in the CRM for, um, for onboarding. And that's just the happy path. What happens if someone abandons the cart? What happens if there's a failed handling of a credit card payment? What happens if the subscri subscription system fails to, uh, to provision the subscription? <laughs> this is a lot of work to build a feature like this. But if you remember back, all we needed to do was to validate whether there was an appetite for buying online. So it turns out you can just do this. You can just build a, a pricing details page, build it in Blade, have a button. When they click the button, a nice alert page saying someone will contact you and then let the manual process do its thing. We get all the information we need here to know whether or not there is even an audience for purchasing online. And then we can build all the other things later. The second side of this is that I think we should build things in the simplest way we possibly can. So I'm gonna go through an example that I still see in a lot of code bases. Um, it is just an example, but I'm gonna pick on the repository pattern a little bit here, sorry. <laughs> so for those who are unfamiliar, this is the repository pattern. Um, it was all the rage back in 2015. <laughs> 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 and the idea that is that instead of directly talking to Eloquent, you abstract access to your data behind some interface. So the interface will look something like this. Um, all the methods to get access to posts uh, are on this, uh, uh, defined here. And then we have to implement an eloquent post repository. And then we have to register the binding in the service provider. And because this is a, a repository service provider, we've got to probably go and change some configuration as well. Or, you know, we could just do this. <laughs> Um, and the reason people like gravitate to these big abstractions, and repository is just one of them, is that they, they kind of sound like they make sense, right? Um, in this case, if we ever needed to change our storage, we just need to write new implementations um, of the interface and everything will just continue to work. And our tests will run really, really fast because we can just mock out the persistence layer entirely. But turns out Eloquent is already a pretty good abstraction over the top of accessing data. Um, if you were ever going to change your persistence layer, and I've never seen that happen, at least not, in, in, not, at, least not like, uh, at large scale, probably not going to move from MySQL to Mongo. You're probably gonna move from MySQL to some other relational database. <laughs> and even if you were gonna change to something that Eloquent doesn't support, you're not gonna be doing it wholesale. It's probably gonna be like one small part of your system that has some performance constraint that you wanna optimize with, I don't know, Mongo or something. And if you did have to do it wholesale, you still have all the work ahead of you. You still have to go and build all of those concrete implementations uh, to support that. And on the testing front, with modern compute, even if you have to hit the database on every single test, it's pretty fast. And if it's not fast enough, you can just run your tests in parallel. Uh, and, and Laravel ha now has a really, really great story for running parallel tests. Uh, it, you, you more or less get it for free, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, mocking out your, um, your uh, data access is probably gonna be faster. But you're talking about the difference between, I don't know, 20 milliseconds if you mock your, your, um, your access to your data or you know 200 milliseconds if you don't and if you're parallelizing all of your tests it 
It's not really going to matter uh, in your day to day. But what you are doing is you're adding a bunch of indirection on the promise that maybe Monday, one day you'll have slightly less pain. Maybe. But you're wearing all the pain of building all of this structure now. So there's advantages to painting within the lines. It's easier to onboard people into unfamiliar parts of the code base. Uh, it's easier to read and make sense of. I mean, I think this is probably way easier than, like, what does that interface do? There may actually be a case for more complex abstractions like this. In fact, I'm pretty sure there is. Um, but remember, do the simplest thing that could possibly work and wait for your code to tell you that, you know, maybe it's time to introduce something a little bit more sophisticated. Habit six, pair programming. I think pairing is the secret source that reinforces every other habit that we talk about. If people don't like feeling, if people don't feel like testing today, their pair will encourage them to do what we all agreed to do. If someone decides to start going off building some giant thing, their pair can rein them back in. It's also a fantastic way to learn and teach. Uh, it helps with onboarding new staff. It helps with onboarding in unfamiliar parts of the code base. It's actually a heap of fun. It is the most difficult one, I think, to get past management, um, speaking as a manager. Um, two people working on one problem versus two people working on two problems, it seems like parallelizing would, would be more effective. And I think that's only true if you think that typing on the keyboard is the most important part of what we do, um, which it isn't. Um, unfortunately, there's not a lot of studies into the benefits of pairing. But the studies that have been done suggest there is a slight time cost to doing this. It's something about 15% slower for a pair to work. But you get benefits in uh, improved design quality, people talking about the things they're changing, you're going to get a better outcome. Uh, reduced defects, significantly reduced defects. In fact, the reduction in bugs is probably the biggest reason to do this from an economic point of view. Reduced staffing risks, more people know how everything works. Uh, better technical skills, better communication. You actually have to talk to people instead of just stick your headphones on and smash a giant coffee. <laughs> So um, Tuple, which is a company that builds some really great uh, pairing software, have a, uh, a section on their website that goes through all of the sort of published material and all of their thoughts about why pairing is great. Um, I'll put a link up somewhere um, so you can go have a look at that. But if you need to convince your boss, there's plenty of material out there. On the subject of remote pair programming, um, I think it's probably fair to say that at least some fraction of the work that we do now is, is not done in an office. There are tools out there to help. So we use a tool called POP. These are a couple of guys that work with me, Armin, who's in the audience, and Aaron. Um, this is entirely staged. I'm sorry, I couldn't actually get a real one. So I just told them the other day to keep us take a photo of you guys pairing. That'd be great. <laughs> um, so this is POP. It's entirely free, um, which is great. So if you've never tried this before and you don't want to invest in tooling, you can go and download POP and have a play with it. Um, there are better and more sophisticated tools out there. Like I mentioned Tubal before. So if you want a more capable solution, there's definitely options. This is basically video chat with the ability to take over someone's keyboard and draw all over their screens. Um, in a pinch, you can use regular uh, video conferencing tools if you like. So you can use uh, Zoom or whatever it is everyone's using these days. But yeah, give pairing a go. It's kind of fun. And the last habit is to cultivate a learning culture. One of the key insights for me over the last couple of years is that the job of software engineers is actually to learn. And the business value that we produce is as a consequence of that learning. So learning and teaching is something that everyone should be encouraged to do, I think. And that can take all sorts of forms. So we run lunch and learns periodically. People will do like a 10 minute talk on something that they're really interested in and then we'll eat lunch and debate whether or not we should adopt it now or later or if it's a silly idea entirely. You can also learn a lot by sitting next to your users. It's really easy if you've got internal users of your system, just go and sit next to them and watch them do the job. Keep your mouth shut, just watch them, take notes. Um, you'll learn stuff about the way that your software is being used that will completely blow your mind. Um, reading and book clubs. Uh, I, I read a ton, that's like one of my um, New Year's resolutions that actually stuck was to read a book a month. Um, so <laughs> I read books and then I, if I find something useful, I 
share the book recommendation around the team. There's other people in the team that do this. Um, but cultivating a learning culture is, I think, crucial to producing or well, creating a high performing team. I am running a smidge behind, but I'm nearly done, I promise. So the convincing your boss part of the talk. Most of these habits you can probably go back to your desk and implement without asking permission. But some of them will require changes to the organization. And there's some really great reasons to try and convince the organization to make the change. So customers and stakeholders who see opportunity transformed into value quickly are generally happier. And I find that people who work in high performing teams are also happier. They're less likely to leave your, your company. Um, and people who've worked in high performing teams are pretty unlikely to want to go and work for a low performing team in the future. So I think if you're not on the path to creating a high performing engineering team, it's, you're going to struggle to find talent in, in the next like few years uh, as, as some of these ideas become more mainstream. But if your boss needs hard numbers, the Dora group at Google published a state of DevOps report every year. Um, and this is a comparison in 2019. And I only use the 2019 slide because the, uh, the slides from the 2021 deck, are, the numbers are so huge that you would have thought I was making them up. <laughs> um, so high performing team, compared to the lowest performing teams, high performing teams um, get 209 times more frequent deployments. And they're 106 times faster at lead time to deploy, which is the time it takes from when you pick the work up to the time that work is running in production with real users. They have a seven times lower change failure rate. So for all of those deployments, the, the likelihood that something's gonna break as a result of that deployment is seven times lower. And when something does go wrong, they're 2,604 times longer, uh, sorry, faster at resolving that, um, that outage. I think I did the numbers on this and it means that the lowest performing teams take like nine months to recover from incidents, which is insane. <laughs> so two of these metrics relate to velocity. The top two blue ones um, relate to velocity and the bottom two relate to quality. And the really interesting thing that I find about high performing teams is that people think that there is a trade off between speed and quality. And it turns out, at least for high performing teams, that there isn't. In order to have high quality, you need fast feedback. Um, and in order to get fast feedback, you need high quality. So they, they form a virtuous cycle. And because of that virtuous cycle, the gap between the lowest performing teams and the highest performing teams is growing. So yeah, um, that's, uh, I think that's my talk, actually. 